this image frighten you? If it does, you're not alone, and it likely isn't your fault. Your brain might be protecting you since it thinks your dentist might be trying to kill you. <laughs> An interesting study done by a group in Taiwan used functional MRI to study the brains of people who may be avoiding the dentist. Did you know that the same parts of the brain that are activated during physical pain are also activated during emotional pain? These regions are activated when we remember past pain, imagine self-pain, and empathize with other people's pain. And it turns out they're also associated with the avoidance of dental treatment. <laughs> These neural correlates of pain and avoidance behavior are meant to protect us and help us survive. Two other experiences we share that also involve regions mediating our physical and emotional responses are when we go through grief from a painful loss and when we eat food. We all experience grief differently, and there are many types of losses, not just bereavement, that can cause profound grief. Grief is a universally shared human experience and a necessary correlate of love. As social animals, attachment is necessary for our survival. When we are separated from these relationships, our bodies scream in anguish, and it can feel like your heart is physically breaking. But really, it is your brain that is breaking. As a scientist who has experienced profound grief myself, I wonder, some cruel joke nature is playing on us, driving us to find attachment only to have it inevitably taken away? Or, is it possible that there is an evolutionary role for grief in our survival as a species? Is it possible we are innately programmed to attach early on in life, so when we eventually experience grief, it serves as an adaptive stress that by design builds future resilience? Your brain is very sensitive to changes in its environment and has developed multiple mechanisms to keep it at a relatively stable equilibrium. We want certainty. But what happens when we experience unpredictable but inevitable loss? In the initial acute stages of grief, a hormone called ACTH signals the release of cortisol, your stress response. This is meant to ready us for battle. But in the case of grief, the stress is persistent and can last for months. So we are flooded with cortisol for a very long battle. Your immune system takes a hit, and it is not uncommon during this time to frequently get sick. The emotional conflict that comes with the sudden emergence of a whole new reality that you're completely unprepared for is so intense that denial may act as a coping mechanism to buy you time so you can adjust. Grief brings an unpredictable roller coaster of emotions, and this disrupts our core physical functions, such as how we sleep, and how we eat. We all need food to survive, so it is possible that nature has provided us a way to heal from our shared experiences of grief through the innate pleasures and social connections through food. Dopamine, for example, is a chemical messenger involved in several neurological pathways, including reward circuits of the brain. Dopamine helps us learn how to get pleasure and is meant to encourage life-sustaining activities that stimulate our pleasure center, such as delicious food and healthy relationships. When we lose our dopamine fix, such as when we lose a loved one, part of the pain we feel is actually a form of withdrawal in addition to the painful memories associated with the loss. But things like delicious food and the social connections through food may still provide us with some healthy dopamine during these times of grief. We also have a second brain that lives in our guts, our enteric nervous system, which has its own pain receptors, taste receptors, hormones, and neurotransmitters. And the bacteria that live in our guts also synthesize and respond to chemical messenger. And we have this bi-directional link between our gut and our brain called the vagus nerve. So our two brains are in communication, both directly and indirectly. Think about all of this the next time you have an emotionally traumatic experience and you feel this deep, visceral pain as if you've been punched in the gut. Also think about what this might mean if you're having dinner with grief. 
Genetic factors involved in these areas contribute to up to half of the variance in our resilience and ability to cope with stressful events. But that leaves the other half or more up to our environment. And it is in this space that we find those unpredictable sources of stress, such as grief. Some of us may have a more difficult time adapting to this stress than others. About 10% of bereaved people will suffer from something called complicated grief which is characterized by an intense, unrelenting state of yearning or mourning for the bereaved that disrupts your ability to function. One of the clinical features of complicated grief, as described in this paper by Dr. Catherine Shear, is the avoidance of situations that trigger painful emotions. In this paper, Dr. Shear mentions a patient who stopped eating oatmeal because it was too painful to remember how he would eat oatmeal every morning with his wife. Again, we see this intersection of food and grief, but this time manifested in a pathological way. For many of us, with the social support of friends and family, we'll find a way to cope with healthy grief and eventually adjust in our own time and in our own way to the new normal of our lives. But others may require professional help to get unstuck and continue to move through the pain. Kumer Speck. <laughs> Kumer Speck. <laughs> That's the German word used to describe the body fat gained from emotional eating due to sorrow or grief. <laughs> it basically translates to sorrow fat or sorrow flab. Comfort <laughs> food feels good, and there are some creative options out there. Uh, for example, a dish called funeral potatoes. So this is a dish comprised of hash browns mixed with cheese, sour cream, cream of chicken soup, butter, and cornflakes. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's definitely some Kumer Speck going on over there. This concept of comfort food in times of grief is nothing new, and it points to how pleasure is rooted in our senses and reward circuits of the brain. And this just isn't the sense of taste. In fact, sight and smell have a greater impact on how we eat than taste alone. And we actually have more than the five senses we've been taught to think we have. Some say we have up to 33. So who knows what else we are unknowingly sensing and imprinting in our memories that is affecting how we eat. Do you order your steak blue? That refers to your steak being very cold or rare on the inside. What if your steak came to you and it was the actual color blue? <laughs> See, blue foods aren't very common in nature and they seem strange to us. And bluish meats? <laughs> well, that might mean spoilage or mold. In fact, in a classic experiment in how we taste with our eyes, perfectly safe steak and fries were dyed with tasteless colors and served to diners in dim lighting so that they appeared totally normal. And the diners enjoyed their meals. Partway through the meal, the researchers turned up the lights, and the diners saw that the steak was blue and the fries were green, and many of them immediately lost their appetites. Some were so affected by the sight that they actually became physically ill and went straight to the bathroom. Your brain likes shortcuts. It gathers information in different substrates and in a range of timescales so that it can make associations, build expectations, and thus better predictions, so you survive. But this system can break if you expect something deeply important to you to be there, and suddenly it is not. I want you to think about your personal food system as we now go through some imaginary dining scenarios. I'm purposefully not using the word diet because we all have our own notions of what diet is or should be, and it often revolves around just nutrition. Your personal food system integrates your sensory gustatory system, your values around food, as well as the social, cultural, and psychological factors around food. And importantly, the system is dynamic. Imagine a time you really enjoyed a meal by yourself no one else to feed or worry about, and you took the time to mindfully enjoy your solo dining experience. Now let's bring grief to the table. Imagine you are a widow, dining alone at the exact same meal. 
You have suddenly found yourself sadly setting a table for one, grocery shopping for one, cooking for one, when you used to enjoy doing these things for two. In the research, this is called loss of commensality, or the act of sharing meals, and it is associated with an increased risk of nutritional vulnerability. This is because dining alone will amplify the sense of loss, making eating less enjoyable, so it affects our ingestive behavior. What I think is really interesting when I read this research, though, is that although dining alone was less enjoyable for these widows, this was independent of the actual enjoyment of the food itself. Stress-induced eating is complex, with overlapping circuits mediating multiple pathways involved. One thing that can happen when you're under a great deal of stress is your sensitivity to pleasure, or your hedonic threshold, rises. What this means is you now need an increase in stimulation or palatability to achieve rewards. If artificial stimulants such as drugs and alcohol are excessively consumed, an endogenous opioid peptide called the dynorphin over time produces a numbing effect to not just the drugs of abuse, but also to everyday pleasures. Remember when I said these widows were still able to enjoy their food even though they were grieving? What this says to me is we have an opportunity here during painful times to find a moment of joy, doing something we have to do anyways, which is eat, by increasing the sensory pleasures from our food. And this is healthy. Imagine your favorite family function or meal with close friends, such as Thanksgiving dinner. The turkey is delicious, you love the pecan pie, and your aunt makes the best mashed potatoes, and you look forward to eating them every year. Now, what if your aunt who made the mashed potatoes isn't there anymore? What if you made her potatoes anyways? And what if you told funny stories about how she would always cut herself peeling the potatoes as you sat down to dinner with your family? This is one way the social connections of food can be healing. The most mundane and salient events of our lives happen at the dinner table. This is where you talk about your day. This is where you admit to your parents you're being bullied in school. This is where you heatedly argue about politics but agree to disagree by the time dessert comes. This is where your cousin tells you she's having a baby. This is where 10 years earlier you were grilling her then boyfriend, now husband, forcing him to defend his place at the table. <laughs> this is where your granddaughter learns about your mother as you share a piece of the pie she used to make for you. This is where you fall in love. The dinner table is the microcosm of life. Now imagine you suddenly find yourself at the table dining alone, with grief as your only companion. I've spent a lot of time in hospitals and have often wondered if patients who share their meals, whether they be home-cooked or not, do better than those who eat their meals alone. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief were based on emotional responses to death and dying. Could commensality be a form of palliative care? We lack a system to support those who are grieving beyond culturally driven acts of mourning from bereavement. How do we support all those suffering from all the other reasons we grieve? We may desperately want to help, but we feel uncomfortable, or we don't know what to do or say. Grief is a highly personal, non-linear process, and we all have to go through it. I believe this is what makes grief such a powerful vehicle for empathy. Because we all have to go through it, we have this tremendous opportunity to gain strength and grow by connecting with others who have also been there. Remember, we all have to eat. The key to continuing to track forward sustainably towards your health goals when you are moved off course by a random event, such as grief, is to incorporate empathy into your personal food system. Imagine a dinner party where you have a newly divorced single mom, a high-profile CEO whose husband has passed away, a young solopreneur who has lost his workplace camaraderie, a trans person who moved and lost their sense of community, and someone who had a pretty normal day who was just invited to this dinner party. Imagine them gathering together, connecting with their own versions of grief, gathering in an environment of inclusivity and acceptance, and invite empathy to dinner. Well, this doesn't have to be an imaginary scenario. This healing gesture can range from inviting a grieving friend out for a bite to eat, 
or helping feed entire communities suffering through the loss from a horrendous hate crime or natural disaster. Find a moment of gastronomic joy as you grieve with others at a fantastic restaurant or as you share soul food around the table at home. Volunteer at a hospice and share a meal with someone who will likely die alone. Find what works for you. It's just dinner and we all need to eat. Your role in this is you just need to show up. Keep it simple to get comfortable with your discomfort to lower the barriers in connecting with people dealing with grief. I want to end the stigma of grief. I don't want anyone to have to feel alone in their shared sorrow. And as grief is the inescapable tie we share if we have loved, my hope is that it provides the avenue to nourish ourselves and heal. We all have to eat, so let's have dinner with grief and empathy. Thank you. Thank you.